Hello, everybody. This is John with John Menarsic Fine Art, and I want to welcome you to another very large oil painting. Um, this isn't as big as those uh, two 24 by 36 monsters I did, but it is pretty good size, 18 by 24. This is an ampersand gesso board with a one and a half inch cradle that I will be painting the edges black uh, as soon as this dries. I'm using Daniel Smith oil paint and I'm using the water mixable oil paint from Daniel Smith. And I'm only using water as the medium. I'm not using the uh, um, fast dry linseed oil or anything like that. One is they say that the fast dry linseed oil dries slower than if you use water as the medium. And the other is I wanted to see how it is. I've tried it a couple times with just water and the medium works better for me than just water. So I wanted to kind of practice and um, see if I can get the water to work better for me. So if you notice and have seen other videos, I usually am not this careful. And you can tell I'm using a real big brush, a two inch bristle brush. That's a real expensive uh, Ace Hardware brush. I think I bought it for like three bucks. Um, but for this one, I wanted to make sure that I didn't clump on the paint too thickly. And I'm going to have, you know, quite a few trees, not quite a few, but, you know, several trees on the left. And um, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, I had a nice, relatively clean area to put them on. And I got this, you know, big, a basic sketch here. And I'm just going at it, putting in the sky and getting stuff going. I don't, uh, I'm not going to have any huge mountains in this one. Mainly going to be trees on the left and then the river going from the left to the right. A little bit of foreground, flowers, and stuff. You know, real nice, pretty summer painting. This is Sunday, and it is, what is today? July 24th. So I hope everybody has had a really good weekend. Um, the weather out here in the Chicago area was crazy. We had uh, tornado sirens go off Saturday morning about, oh gosh, when was that? Well, our phones went off at about 5.40 in the morning with the uh, emergency broadcast system. And then the um, tornado alarm outside went off in our area about five, ten minutes later. <clears throat> and there was supposedly a tornado that touched down, you know, in the neighborhood next, um, right next to us. And then uh, a little further down, there was another one supposedly. But we didn't see a lot of damage when we went out earlier that day on Saturday. But it rained like a son of a gun probably until about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And then this morning, we had another thunderstorm, but not severe, but a lot of decent amount of thunder, a little lightning. And that started about 2 a.m., and then the thunder and lightning ended at about 7 a.m., and then the rain was a couple hours later. So all together, in two days, we got two and a half inches, which is really good rain-wise because we've been kind of in a drought in the Midwest here. And now our grass will be green and start growing again. But uh, overall, it's been a great weekend, a little wet. We went to an art show in uh, Geneva, Illinois. I wasn't part of it. They turned me down, actually, uh, this year. And I wanted to check out the show anyway, because Geneva, uh, Geneva is a beautiful uh, town in uh, Illinois. So we went there, and we got there probably an hour after the rain stopped, and there's a lot of people. It was a really nice layout and everything else. So I'm going to try again next year to see if I can get accepted into that show, because I really want to do it. It's um, not it's uh, late... It's not Lake Geneva. It's Geneva's the town. Lake Geneva's in Wisconsin. But Geneva, Illinois, is uh, right on the uh, Fox River. It's a really beautiful area. Older neighborhoods and stuff, well kept up. Nice little shops and stuff. It's a bit touristy, it's, but it's a really beautiful um, atmosphere over there. And they had probably, I want to say 150 to 160 vendors lined up on the street. And they closed off the main street, going all the way down. And they had the tents on both sides it was really beautiful and uh, there's a lot of gorgeous art and one of the things I like about Geneva is they had more painters there than any art show I've ever seen before I'm guessing three quarters of the exhibitors were painters of some sort um, and even a soft pastel artist was there and soft pastels as you know I love they're absolutely beautiful they're a pain in the neck to uh, transport and uh, things like that and store but they're a beautiful medium and uh, they had watercolors, they had collage, they had clay, they had all kinds of fine art. And like I said, the majority were painters, and it was just a whole beautiful setup. My wife and I spent, you know, maybe a couple hours over there just 
talking to people and checking everything out and seeing what was going on. And then today we did our normal errands and then I'm making a video. So you saw this guy and if you notice I've been using the palette knife a lot lately for the clouds. I love the way the clouds look with the palette knife and then using a bristle brush to gently kind of diffuse the color and move it around. And I'm not going to take credit for that uh, technique. I learned that from a uh, great YouTube artist uh, by the name of Stuart Davies. He does a lot of tonalism and stuff, but one of the way he's one of the ways, excuse me, he does his clouds is similar to what I did here. Now his are much better than mine, but the technique is very similar, and that's where I learned it from. And Stuart Davies, he's uh, Englishman, lives in the south of France, I believe, and he has some absolutely incredible work. And he's a very good uh, teacher as well. He has uh, some voiceovers that are sped up, and he has some that are regular real time. But uh, you need to check out his channel. He, uh, he's really, really good at what he does. And he's got a real easy voice to listen to. So, you know, it's very, it's ne if it, he has a video that's over an hour, it's no big deal because his voice is easy to listen to. He's got a bit of a dry sense of humor, so he keeps it uh, light and stuff. So definitely worth uh, checking out and subscribing to his channel. I know I have. I learned a lot from him. Okay, this is another one of my expensive $2 brushes. And... This one is kind of beat up, and I didn't throw it out because I thought to myself, wow, as messed up as those bristles look, this might be really good for foliage, which it is. You can see how that nice little mid-ground tree line worked out, just tapping those in. And um, don't ever throw your old brushes out unless there's nothing left, because you always have a use for them as a landscape artist. If you have to be a lot more precise, like with um, a portrait or something, that might be a little troublesome, but when you're doing landscapes and you got all kinds of foliage everywhere and stuff, trust me, those old frayed bristles and stuff, they're really, uh, they're really come in handy. Now, I don't do a lot of deciduous trees, and quite honestly, I'm not sure why. I love the fir type trees, the pine trees, that type. Um, I know I love the way they smell. I love the way they look in a landscape and especially in the mountains, which I do a lot of mountains and mountain river scenes. But today I wanted to do some more deciduous trees and I'm going to leaf them on and I'm going to use a one inch brush to kind of tap the leaves in. And I'm going to make a decent amount of branches, but not a ton. Okay. I'm not going to go overdo it because there is going to be um, quite a bit of leaves and stuff covering them. But I did want, you know, them to show through at times here and there. So, and then they got this real big tree here in the foreground. And it's funny, too, because I didn't even think about it because I don't know why. I was listening to, I was really getting into my Jimmy Buffett music that was going on. And normally what I would do is paint the river undercoat first and then put that big tree in the middle, the one to the right of the other trees, because that one goes over the river. So instead, I paint the tree first, so I got to really kind of take my time and cut in where the water is from the tree and then expand the tree trunk a little bit, because I'm listening to Margaritaville and not thinking about what order I should be doing this to make it a little easier on myself. But that does happen. It's summertime, I love that kind of music, and every once in a while, it's just like, oh well. Now, since this is the foreground, I'm going to highlight all the trees, but this one's going to be, I'm going to work on a little bit more just to get a little bit more highlight on there. There's going to be a decent amount of these other trees because they're behind it a little bit, but still not in the background. So they're all going to have highlights on the main trunks and a little bit on some of the um, secondary big branches, like that one coming from the uh, main trunk to the right. But um, the one that's going to have the most detail is going to be the one I'm working on at the moment. And I'm going to kind of scrape some stuff off and put stuff on and scrape some off until I get it the way I want. I don't usually like fussing with something and picking at it too much. But every once in a while, it's at a point where I have to change it a little bit. And yes, if you're guessing I'm painting lefty, I'm doing this for you. You understand? I'm doing this for you. If I was doing this right-handed, I'd have to have my body in the way, and I'd have to be 
kind of contort the rest of my upper body to um, get it on. So I figured, okay, give it a try with my left hand and see what happens. I'm only putting a little bit of highlight on a tree, so what's the worst that can happen? So, and actually it came out a little better than I thought it was going to. And then I didn't um, get my big body in the way and mess up your viewpoint. So one of the things that I like on this one is... Actually, there's a lot of things I like on this whole composition. It's a basic composition, okay? And if you notice, I don't have anything complicated in my compositions. When I do plain air work, which I'm going to be doing as soon as the weather breaks and it stops being 98 degrees and 90% humidity, you're going to see when I do plain air work, I also don't like to go complicated. My videos are kind of geared towards beginner to intermediate, okay? To where I'm trying to show how you can do, how anybody can do a painting and have it look really nice without spending a ton of time on it. You know, this painting itself from start to finish, and like I said, this is an 18 by 24. This took just under an hour real time. I think it was 48 minutes or something like that. 48 and change, some, somewhere in that area. I don't remember exactly. And it's wet into wet, obviously. I don't use the Bob Ross method with magic white or anything like that. It's a dry canvas. And actually, it's the wood. It's the Ampers and uh, Gesso board, so it's actually hardwood. And all of my stuff is basic, but one of the things I learned on a couple of the art classes I did take, I didn't take a lot, but a couple of them I did take, and also talking to other artists that are actually doing this as a living, less is more. Don't get complicated just for the sake of being complicated. A simple landscape composition is just as good as anything else. And when you look at nature itself, when you're driving by a forest preserve, when you're at the Arboretum, whatever the case may be. You know, your eyes pick out the simple shapes and the simple forms. And when I paint and when I come up with compositions or I see something that's a picture that I want to try to use as a reference, anything like that, I look for the simplest of compositions. And when you have a simple composition... Then you can concentrate on your colors. You can concentrate on, okay, the lightness and darkness, you know, the values. You can concentrate on how you're doing other stuff because your composition's already taken care of. So my advice to you today is don't overcomplicate anything. It's painting. It's not brain surgery. Yes, there are things you got to learn. Yes, things can be complicated. But you break it down to its simplest form, and you go with that. And that's what I do. I break it down to its simplest form. When I first started painting, I used to make everything complicated. I would, I mean, I'm not kidding. That tree, I would have taken probably 45 minutes on that one tree alone. And it never worked. It never made a difference. It just, it looked flat, and it looked overdone. So spontaneous and simple, in my opinion, looks the most appealing in paintings. And that's one of the things a beginner needs to understand and get in their head is sometimes the biggest beauty is the simplicity of the piece. And that's kind of what I try to teach people when I have uh, classes in person and, you know, when I do videos. It doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be something from inside of you, something from your heart. Okay, now one of the things I'm doing here... You saw me put the highlights on with a fan brush. What I wanted to do is I wanted the texture, but I didn't want them sticking out as much as it was with a brush. So believe it or not, usually a palette knife gives you more texture and a brush doesn't. I this case, I flipped it a little bit, and I'm using the knife to not only smooth it out a little bit more to kind of round the trunks, but I also, as you saw, I was putting in some black mixed with uh, French ultramarine. Or was it black by itself? No, I think it was black mixed with something else. And I believe it was the French ultramarine to give the uh, shadow parts of the tree where the sun was going to be uh, missing it. 
And then get used to using all of your tools. And also, don't worry about buying expensive brushes. I, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have one brush that's considered expensive in the art world. Um, again, I learned this actually from Stuart Davies. He uses the cheap hardware brushes, bristle brushes, two and three inch, and I think he has maybe a one inch too. He has some big brushes because he has some real big paintings he does. And he paints on wood also. I don't believe he uses ampersand. I think he uh, treats his own uh, plywood and stuff. But he has some really big uh, big paintings that he does. But anyways, he is a professional artist and has been for many years. And he uses a lot of those cheap bristle brushes that you get at you know, Ace Hardware and stuff like that. And he was right. I've been using them now for a little while. And they do just as good. And if you take care of them, they last just as long. That brush I'm using now, that thing's got to be three months old. And I use the heck out of it. So I don't have any. And I have some Hobby Lobby brushes that they're the master's touch for the Hobby Lobby brushes. They have some decent brushes for the money. You wait until they have the master's touch stuff at 50% off. And that's when you buy your brushes. I'm not too wild about their paint, the master's touch paint. But I do uh, like their brushes. And I do like their um, their red label canvas with the gallery wrap edges. I think it's an inch and a half. And I like their uh, gold label um, canvas. Those two are pretty nice canvases. Their other stuff I'm not too wild about at all. But the gold label canvas I like. And like I said, I also like the uh, red label with the real deep uh, cradle. Now this is one of my favorite ways to do flowers. Whether it's along a riverbank or in the middle of a field, whatever the case may be. I just like taking ultramarine blue and Payne's gray or ultramarine blue and black. Sometimes I'll put a little alizarin crimson in there to get a real nice, rich, deep color. And then I'll do that stroke that you just saw where I touch and lift up. And that's what's going to give me the base that I'm going to touch the flowers on. And then I just put that row of grass in to kind of give myself an idea in my head exactly where I'm going to go. Now, I'm using pure yellow right now, but if you notice, I'm going over it multiple times in the same area to blend it into the brown, which is basically burnt umber and alizarin crimson, um, and that's how I'm getting to this nice olive green look, and that's what I wanted to get. So I took the pure yellow, and then I just kept tapping it in to do a basically blending on the surface to get the olive green. And sometimes it's easier to do that than on your palette because you have it next to the colors um, that you already have, and then you can see, you know, how it looks. And this is a violet color from Daniel Smith that I absolutely love, mixed with a little titanium white, and that's how I make my flowers. And obviously you can do them any color you want, but they look so much nicer from the ones I used to make. And... Um, you got to obviously keep the dark so you, so you can see the light. You can't have light without dark and vice versa. But, you know, I really, it's a simple way to do it. And it really comes out nice. And if you think about it, so far, everything you've seen in this video, nothing is overly complicated. Nothing you need, nothing that I've done requires a four-year art degree, you know, from Columbia or anywhere else. It just takes practice. And practice is going to develop your eye and your hand-eye coordination. And once you have your vision, let's say, of what you want to paint, and you have that hand-eye coordination, you're there. The rest of it is just fine-tuned then. And that's what practice does. It gives you the ability to get the eye adjusted to, you know, a vision to see what you want to paint. And then it helps your eye uh, hand-eye coordination. And like I said, once you have those two, then you can tweak everything else. And that's really all there is to it. This big delay was mixing the color that I wanted because I wanted a nice dark green, much darker than the olive because I'm going to use that as a base. And then what I'm going to do is after I got the base down, I'm going to take a shop towel, not a paper towel, a shop towel, and I am going to take off the excess oil so when I put the highlight on, it doesn't turn into mud. It actually has a real nice pretty highlight. Now, the shop towel method I learned from Kevin Hill, who has a YouTube channel, a very successful one, 
And I think it's Paint With Kevin or Kevin Hill Oil Painting. I forget what it is. I think it's Paint With Kevin. And he has some beautiful um, work. He's mainly oils, but he does do some acrylic work. But his work is he's a very talented artist. And he's also a very good teacher. And this uh, little thing here that you're going to see here shortly is uh, what I learned from him. It's a shop towel that I bought at Walmart. It's, uh, I think it was a six pack or uh, six rolls. And it was you know, like 10, 12 bucks at Walmart. And they're really cool because they don't shed. Okay. You notice the way I'm pressing down, but I'm not moving the towel. Okay. I'm just kind of keeping it stationary and then using my hand and I'll keep it on for, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, whatever. I'll rub it a little bit with my hand. And basically, that's going to take the excess off so it's not as thick. Like I said, it's so when you put the highlight on, it doesn't turn into mud. And watch what comes up. Look at how much. That's the excess that you'd be trying to get the crisp highlight on. And when you have it that much, it just makes it, again, makes it simpler to do the job you need, which in this case is putting the highlight. Look how crisp that is now. And you've got that nice bright color as the highlight and you're not making mud and it's really a nice believable look to the tree. So there you go. I sell my paintings at shows and I sell them online and I've sold quite a few paintings. Not enough to be a full-time artist yet, but and I'm working on it, but I've had success with my work. And yet, I still pick up stuff from other artists like Stuart Davies that I mentioned today and Kevin Hill. Never, regardless of how good you think you are, never be afraid to learn more from other people. There's always somebody that might have an idea that you don't or know something you don't. Never be afraid to learn. Never think you're so good where you don't have to, you know, seek advice from somebody else. It's it's art. And I don't think you ever know everything. I really don't. So the more kind of Q&A you can do with people and, you know, find other artists and talk their ear off and learn about how they look at stuff, the better you're going to be as an artist. The more information you get, the better you're going to be. Okay, now this alizarin crimson I put on straight from the two, which I normally don't. And I didn't blend it in. I wanted it to stand out a little bit just to diffuse the stark green that I had as like the base layer um, underneath those distant trees, the mid-ground trees. So that's what I did with that. It's just a lizard crimson to look like distant bushes that are dark to go with the light yellow strip of grass in front of them and then a little bit lighter of the tree line right behind it. So it's just a contrast thing. Speaking of which... This now is the main foreground that I'm putting some more flowers on. And I'm using the same colors that I used for the purple flowers. The only difference is I put it on with that one-inch brush that I'm using right there. And I'm just tapping on some little pinkish little flower clumps here. And then I'm going to use a darker color to pull up and put in some grasses right in front just to kind of ground it a little bit, to make it look like it's part of the landscape as opposed to being, you know, placed on top. And that's one of the things you want to do with trees, flowers, anything, is you want to do what I call grounding them. And that's where you make them look like they're part of the landscape, just like what I'm doing right here. You know, you don't have to be dainty with it, but that grass that you're pulling up now makes everything look like it's growing together the way it actually is in nature. So this is my latest 18 by 24 Again, this is a piece of ampersand gesso board with Daniel Smith water mixable oil paint. And I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, consider subscribing to my channel. And if you do go to the point where you're going to subscribe, then you might as well just hit that bell and be notified every time I upload a video. I hope everybody has a great rest of your weekend and a great work week. And I will see you next time.